Hello and welcome to part one of this special three-part GradCast episode series. Here we are going to be talking with Western graduate students and ask them how COVID-19 and lockdown since late March has impacted their research and work from spring throughout the summer till now. In this episode, hosts Gavin Tolometti and Francesco Colosimo talk with students Kristen Prentice and Adam DeBosha. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, special episode of GradCast where we are bringing to light how COVID-19 has impacted fellow grad students at Western University. I am joined here with Kristen Pentis. Uh, very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, so um, I was wondering if you could quickly maybe tell the audience before we jump into the topic of COVID, like what type of work is it that you do at Western? Um, so I'm a fourth year PhD student. I'm in the Health and Rehabilitation Sciences program um, in the Health and Aging stream. So my research focuses on older adults moving to new homes and how leisure may play a role in that process. Um, so um, just that's what I'm working on right now, uh, dissertation only at this point and working on manuscripts. Um, let me just jump into the story or? Yeah, if you want, we can jump straight into the story. Okay, yeah. Um, so I guess I was writing my proposal until like December 2019 and submitted to ethics. And in that process, I was supposed to um, work with retirement homes and I had even reached out to them. Um, I was going to be looking at older adults moving into retirement homes and how leisure may have played a role in that in that transition. Um, and it just seemed so easy because uh, the first three homes I contacted, they're all like, yes, we'd love to participate in your study. Um, and so that was great and it seemed too easy. <laughs> um, hadn't <Yeah>. got uh, <laughs> ethics approval yet at this point. So I said to them, you know, like, should be any day now and, and then we can uh, get started. And so what it was, was um, a focused ethnography. So I was supposed to go there and do two months um, of just participant observation. Uh, and I would just be um, watching the older adults do like formal and informal leisure activities, um, just seeing where they would engage in these uh, spaces in the home. And um, I would follow up with doing focus groups and have them all um, talking with each other and with me about leisure activities that they did um, before their move and how that changed after they moved to a retirement home. Um, and they were also going to draw mental maps. Um, and that would just be like simple drawings of the retirement home and where they would engage in leisure from their point of view. Um, and then the last part of it was to be doing go along interviews, which would involve me going with one participant out into the community, uh, doing a leisure activity and sharing that experience with them and then talking about it. And well, all of that <laughs> involves being in person, right? So um, that grew challenging after March hit and I still hadn't had ethics approval just yet. Um, and so it was sort of like, <laughs> What am I going to do? <laughs> um, and at that point, it just became about like coming up with a plan B. So I got ethics approval in April and I had to just redesign the whole thing. Um, I was like, can I even still do an ethnography? Because a key piece is participant observation. And well, you can't really play big brother in retirement homes. Like there's so many things wrong with that and ethics and it just would have been a disaster. So we had to look at different aspects that we could gain or like different avenues we could get to um, that could still get the information we needed. So from participant observation, um, that would involves a lot of time and seeing where people uh, go. So instead we came up with maybe doing three online interviews. Um, that way it wouldn't have to be in person and one would be a narrative interview and the second one would be an activity diary. So they could talk about um, activities they did before their move and then activities they did after their move. Um, and that would sort of create a timeline that we could look at um, and we could see the transition in that way. And then there was also um, the mental maps piece we could still keep. Um, and that would be the third interview that we could see like what their home was like before they moved and then 
now after they moved where they engaged in leisure there and if they still kept up with their community contacts. Um, so that was the plan after lots of consultation and um, like uh, <laughs> how we could maintain the study without having to do a whole methods rewrite. Um, and so we sent that into ethics shortly after getting approval. And so now it's July <laughs> um, and I, contact those homes that had said yes and they uh sort of said like uh we can't help you <laughs> it's we're we're so full to we're so busy all of our staff can't put any time aside to help you with any sort of virtual interviews or anything like that which makes sense so i think that's when things started to get really sticky because it sounded great right just redo this whole method section and how we could go about getting data in a different way. Um, but that proved to not be feasible. So plan B started becoming like, okay, let's try the other retirement homes. But, you know, assuming it'd be the same sort of outcome, all of them said love to, but can't. Um, so then <laughs> we went to seniors apartment buildings and it was the same sort of thing. Either they haven't had a lot of new people move in or they just weren't interested or it um, it was too much of a hassle, those, those sorts of things. So um, it was sort of like, how, how am I gonna keep the culture? Because that's a key component of ethnography is like, what what is this transition? Who are these people moving? Where are they moving to? What is this becoming? What is the study becoming? Um, and so then it was like, all right, older adults moving to new homes within the community in London. And so that's where I am now. <laughs> um, but it's still been a whole bunch of like reaching out to different um, organizations in the community um, and seeing uh, if they can reach seniors anywhere um, and if they've moved within a year, which is what I was looking for. Seniors that were over 65 that have just moved to any home of any size in London. Yeah. So um, I'd say that uh, July, August was probably the hardest part um, in terms of not being too discouraged with data collection. Um, everything else had just been like theories or in theory, recruitment shouldn't be too difficult um, or we'll face these challenges as they come along. But uh, here we are in October and I've, I've received two participants and I needed about 10. So it's still an ongoing challenge and, you know, older adults are the most vulnerable population at this point in time and they don't want to have, they don't have time for research. They just want to stay safe in their homes and then asking them to do online interviews on top of that. It's uh, just a little bit challenging. So uh, just working through those things, people in the community have been great um contacting real estate agents so that's kind of an innovative way people have come up with some interesting techniques um to how who to contact and how to get to seniors anywhere in the community so um data collection and recruitment and during covid has definitely been about thinking outside the box for me <laughs> um and yeah best ways to reach people um, which I'm sure a lot of people are struggling with right now as well. So. Yeah, it does sound like like with um, with everything going on, it's definitely brought up new challenges for all students. And it definitely sounds like for you having to get in contact, even just to virtually meet with some of these um, elderly people to understand about their movement from one home to another. But even though I know you said you've only had, you've only got two this month and you wanted 10, but it does sound like your resilience is still strong enough to keep on pushing to make sure you can try and one, learn about how these people have moved, let, be able to help them, but still try to keep, make it safe and uh, easier on them since for, for the pandemic for anyone above 65, it's probably a lot more scarier for us who are a lot younger. Uh, so how while well, you've been since you had to re-strategize how you would get some of these interviews and i know you mentioned zoom and i know and you did say a lot of them probably weren't keen on the idea of doing something virtual or involving online 
uh, did they did the retirement homes or any of your participants ever ask for specific alternatives? Um, so I haven't had direct contact with uh, the seniors, and that was part of the problem. I think it would have been easier if I could have had a chance to build rapport with them, um, either by doing presentations or things like that. But it's that whole gatekeeper process. They're saying it's the building saying like we can't let you in. We like no virtual presentation either. So I think that if I had had that chance to build rapport in other ways there, we could have talked about all their alternatives or, or ways of getting information to them. Like maybe families could have helped out, but because it's sort of like, um, you can only contact uh, the gatekeeper. That's sort of the only avenue you can take at that point. But um definitely considering different ways of doing things because i realized that not everybody has access to um tablets computers or smartphones right or let alone like being able to use zoom um talked about telephones but then again how am i supposed to see their maps how am i supposed to see their diaries there's the whole like i guess they can mail them in but it's helpful when um, because I've had two participants, we did it over Zoom, it was so easy. They just showed me their maps and I took a screenshot with their permission and it's, it, it worked out really well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like, um, you know, a bit of a challenge. I know my roommate um, was having similar challenges and he had to reach out to patients in a hospital to gather his data and he was you know, had to come up with novel and kind of creative ways to reach them as well. Um, and I guess one thing that I was wondering personally is, you know, considering that you're looking at leisure activities in older adults, um, you know, of the data that you have collected, do you find that it's being kind of affected by COVID in itself, considering the fact that we're under quarantine and, you know, leisure activities for everyone is kind of at a low right now? Definitely, and that's that's definitely a good point. Um, that came up in discussion. I tried <laughs> saying in all of the tools that I gave them, the activity diary instructions and the mental lab, like try to draw these things before COVID happened um, because I was trying to grasp that, but it's gonna be inevitable. COVID came up in every single interview um, because that's the biggest impact that they noticed. And it's definitely gonna be written as a theme in the dissertation uh, in one way or another. Um, because it is the biggest impact uh, that they've seen. I think that um, if I still am recruiting by March, then they will have moved through COVID. Um, there won't have been any other time that they moved. So um, it'll all be COVID-based data anyways. So there's that possibility to think of as well. Would that impact your research a lot if it's entirely COVID based or would it give you a, something to compare to people that maybe moved prior to COVID? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I haven't really fully thought it through, but I know it's definitely going to be in there. So will it affect it for sure? But I think it's important that it affects it as well, because this is something um, that's happened and uh, people need to know what it was like during the pandemic as well. How did you transition during a pandemic? So it will have important elements to it, even if it doesn't answer that full question, like what's the role of leisure during regular times? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, unfortunately we are starting to run out of time, but I wanted to quickly ask, what would you say is the biggest learning curve that you've taken when this happened? Even, I know it was probably very stressful and very, a lot, a lot of things to think about as soon as COVID just comes out of nowhere and stop pretty much puts a lot of people's research on hold. But what was it that you learned in particular that maybe you think is going to help you in the future? Um, I guess just using all of your resources. I found having weekly meetings with my supervisor like amazing and uh, really supportive during those times of like, man, what am I going to do? I haven't had anybody in a month and a half and nothing's going well. So definitely just using um, social support around, like, I don't know, doing my own leisure activities. <laughs> that helps a lot too. So just using everything around you that you, you can, I'd say. No, I think that's very good advice for a lot of people probably listening to this will 
be able to take. I, I know I've been trying to find new ways to <laughs> make it be, feel a little bit better. That all, there's a lot of stuff now I can't do because of COVID, but there's ways to make the experience better, I would say. Definitely. Yeah. And if anyone, thank you very much for sharing your story. And I know it does sound like you are pushing through it and I wish you all the best for reaching out to more um, uh, senior homes and hoping you could get the data that you need. Uh, so if anyone really wanted to ask more about your, your story, uh, where could they find you? Um, they could just email me um, and that's kprenti4 at uwo.ca. Um, and I can send that to you after if that's easier as well. Yes, we can add that to the show notes for everyone to find. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank. Oh, no problem. Thank you very much for your time, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. Good luck with your research. Thank you so much. I'm Adam. I am uh, right now, I'm a year three, my PhD program in English. Um, so when COVID hit, I was trans trans like transitioning between year two and year three uh, for the English department. That's when you have to sit your primary uh, comprehensive exam at the end of year two, um, which for me meant reading 100 books on uh, cultural studies and then sitting uh, written and then oral exam, uh, which is of course very stressful in regular times, in COVID times even more stressful than usual. Um, and uh, about a month, a month and a half, uh, before the exam, uh, the university shut down and closed access to the library. Uh, and of course, the library is where all the books are. And, you know, you're hoping to be able to read these books in preparation for your exams. And uh, we weren't really given a lot of warning on that. And I understand that the university had to respond very quickly to a very uh, desperate situation. Uh, but not a lot of thought was given, at least in our department, to how this would affect our ability to do our research and to prepare for our exams. And so it's just like, find another way. And like, very luckily, uh, the students like got together and we were able to like point to different electronic resources for the books that we weren't able to access. And so we were able to make it work, but it really was mostly a grassroots response more than a top-down university to grad student response. Uh, so it worked out, but maybe not in the way um, we, we could have hoped. Um, then yeah, not having access to the library has definitely been a bit difficult, generally speaking, for the research. Uh, same thing, transitioning from year two to year three, at least in the English department, is when you're supposed to really start doing your research. Uh, you, uh, you're supposed to present a prospectus to your department, basically outlining what your project is going to be, what your major uh, scholars are, what your topic is. And to do that properly, you need access to books, to resources, to, to so many things. And the library is closed. Um, so it's just like makes everything very difficult and the university or, and the department did not come forward with a plan. Uh, didn't come out and just say, okay, we're giving everybody like an extra month, an extra two months on um, when you're expected to give the prospectus. The expectation was still to meet the same deadlines as usual. Um, and uh, around the PhD process, there's always a lot of uh, hidden curriculum, you know, you don't know stuff unless you ask and you need to know what questions to ask to get the right answers. Nobody gives you the information. And in this social distancing universe, it's very difficult to get the information you need, right? Because uh, you need to ask the right questions. I have like organized meetings at set times with people you can't just bump into a professor in a corridor and say, hey, I heard I'm supposed to do this. How does that work? You know, all of that natural uh, networking just isn't possible uh, when, you're, when you're working online. So that made things very difficult. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of, so my personal perspective is, to be fair, this is also because I'm not the best writer and I struggle at like putting, as all grad students do, putting the ideas in my brain on, on paper correctly. Uh, but my perspective ended up getting delayed by three months. Uh, basically it took me the whole summer to, uh, get in the right mindset to be able to write in a way that my department, uh, approved. And so finally, I've been able to start my research uh, in September when I was supposed to start really doing my research back in June, July. So there, there's definitely been a, a bit of delay with my with my work personally. Um, and I think, just, you know, like everybody's feeling right now, uh, it's a tough time 
<laughs> just anything like it's COVID, it's tough for everybody. Uh, and uh, research and writing are things that are difficult if your mind is busy. Uh, and how can it not be busy uh, in in this situation? I'm I'm blessed. I'm I have an office from which I can work uh, in my own home. Uh, so I, it's not like I have to be working in on the kitchen table with like five brothers and sisters jumping all over me. So I, I, I am blessed that way, but still it's very difficult to find the right mindset to put in the work uh, and just uh, get it done, get focused, not get distracted with, with everything that, that's happening in the world. Plus politics and all of those things happening. It's, it's very difficult to just stay focused. And um, one thing with that is like, there's no separation, right? Everything is happening in this room. Uh, the research, the work, but also the social media, the entertainment, the, everything is happening in one space. Whereas before it was nice to be able to go to campus and do the work and then come home and say, okay, my day's done. I've done my nine to five like work day. I can unplug. Now everything is virtual. Um, so it's just very difficult to like find the right value. And that definitely is for me. And I think for, uh, most of my friends in the English department has made, has made things very difficult uh, in like being able to find the right boundaries and stay energetic in what we're doing and staying motivated throughout. And there's just whole days just go by and like, what the heck happened today? Because I had, I had five hours. I, I have no idea what happened in those five hours. And uh, something's the end of the day and just like, okay, do I work now? Or do I just like start tomorrow? And of course, the answer is always I'll start tomorrow, except that tomorrow is then today. So you're going to work tomorrow again and et cetera, et cetera. You just never get to work. And it's, yeah, in no time at all, it, it is over. Um, to, to give a, a concrete example, um, I, I had a meeting with my supervisor for my research uh, and I had not realized when we were in the calendar. And he asked me for a, a loose deadline on when I would give him a first draft of writing, my, my first 15 pages, whatever. I was like, yeah, uh, I'll get those to you by October 30th. Thinking, you know, it's about halfway through the semester. Um, I had not realized we were September 28th when I made that promise, uh, which gave me like a month, which is perfectly doable. A month of 15 pages in normal circumstances is easy, no problem. Uh, 15 pages in a month in a pandemic is a very, very different. Um, obstacle uh so yeah that's supposed to be tomorrow <laughs> and the 15 pages are not quite written uh so i i have talked to my supervisor about it and i've asked for asked for a little extension uh and he's been fine with it no problem um but extension upon extension is just going to make things a lot more delayed um and generally speaking in uh, i don't know how it works really with all other departments with English, uh, very few people finish their PhD in four years, it usually takes five or six or more. Most of my friends in the program are actually year X, so beyond funding. Um, so yeah, like all, all of this is adding on to uh, those anxieties, not just right now, but how are things gonna be two years from now, three years from now. Uh, and with, uh, with people who have anxiety and who look you can't help but think towards the future beyond uh just a, the immediate timeline it's very difficult to see ahead with any sort of uh peace right now uh so that's why i think those are the three big ways in which the, these times have been very difficult for me and for most of the people i talk with from uh, from my department yeah so that was me rambling for <laughs> nine minutes that's not bad No, yeah, I, I definitely relate to the part about how, you know, you had a month to do a certain task, maybe between updates with your supervisor and so mm -hmm. on. And you're about a week away from that, from that deadline. And you're like, oh, crap, I need to, uh, I need to start doing this. Um, and I guess my question to you is, how do you get over that? Like, what are some strategies that you have for yourself that just keep you in that research mind, even at over you know this quarantine even at certain periods of time when i find it i'll tell you and uh, we, we, <laughs> we, we, we can share um well, the, the cool thing for me is actually the topic i is is a fun one and I, I forgot to share uh so i'm my research is actually on the adaptation of fantasy novels 
from books to TV shows and movies. So it's a really cool topic. Uh, I'm looking at uh, Game of Thrones, The Lord of the Rings, and Harry Potter, and how they transition from the books to the show uh, and to the movies. So it's, it's a really fun topic. I enjoy doing the research for this. Uh, I love finding cool articles that are dealing with uh, what I want to talk about right now. I'm looking at uh, the adaptation of gay characters from the books to the movies or possible gay characters and how it gets translated into the movies. Uh, right now, looking at the Lord of the Rings more specifically and the whole amb ambiguity of the Frodo-Sam relationship and how that reflects on masculinity. So it's something I'm very happy to research. Researching it is not the issue. I uh, like My desk right now is covered with books. Uh, it's absolutely great. The difficulty is then finding the energy more to transition that into then producing um the writing the research is doable um but to some extent and this uh, this has always been the case for i think for many phd people doing the research can also be a way of procrastinating the writing of the actual uh thing you need to produce so you spend all your time reading 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 and then you just don't end up writing what you're supposed to be writing um and unfortunately for me writing has been very difficult forever always and with the anxieties of the pandemic on top of the regular stuff it is it is quite difficult so the the way i've gotten over it is my classic um writing block techniques of just just write like it doesn't need to be good this time write a rough draft it's fine just get the words on the page and uh, so now i have seven pages um of the 15 ish i promised my supervisor by tomorrow so it's not gonna happen but at least I'm, I have seven pages that I can then like go back and rework. And uh, once you get the ball rolling, it is easier. Um, that has been like the, the lack of structure in the pandemic is definitely difficult uh, because again, you're, you're just in the same space all day. There's no break to meetings, no break to class or to anything. It's just, you're always here. Um, so that is, you need to find ways to restructure your time so that you can dedicate like an hour, two hours to reading, one hour, two hours to writing and just finding ways to structure that for yourself. Uh, I, I've been having difficulty, uh, definitely. Um, I am I am halfway uh, in terms of word count, at least to, to what I had promised. Uh, it's going to need a lot of reworking, a lot of rewriting, uh, but that's, uh, I guess, quite normal for a PhD generally, just even more difficult uh, these days. Yeah, and this is going quite far back in the in your story that you mentioned, oh. putting what words that are in your head onto mm -hmm. paper. I can definitely relate to that when I try to write my papers. I'll think of something that I think, oh, you know what, that's beautifully crafted. Let's put this on Word document. And it's, uh, and it's as if I'm five years old again, trying to type mm -hmm. out what I just thought. And then I read it again, think, Mm -hmm. I don't understand how this doesn't work and why I struggle to do this, but I definitely agree with your advice of just write, even if it's mm -hmm. going to be absolute, if it's, even if it's not your best work, just getting it out onto the paper at least will help you jog ideas of how to mm -hmm. improve from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I guess like it's a, it, with the difficulties that you have had to face and trying to find the best ways to keep motivation and overcoming writer's block and I'm actually quite interested with it now if you research connecting fantasy novels to TV. Mm -hmm. So it's slightly off topic. Out of the three you're stuff focusing on, what's mm -hmm. your favorite? Yeah, it depends for what. Um, I the, the the story that got me started with literature generally is Harry Potter. Uh, I'm I was of the age uh, of Harry in the movies. You know, you just <laughs> and and waiting. Uh, I was actually I was I was a movie first book second uh, discovery of Harry Potter. I actually hated reading, and now I'm an English major, which is <laughs> quite a testament to J.K. Rowling's uh, storytelling. Um, but yeah, it was in the transition from I think it was movie three to movie four, and I had the fourth book was already published, and I read it, and I was like, so what's going to happen next? And but book five was announced, so I just reread, reread, reread book four. And that's what got me actually into essentially doing literary studies uh, because I was trying to guess like themes and try to predict what, was, what could happen next. And before being taught it you know, academically, I was basically figuring out 
what character growth was and how how all of these things work. And so that was uh, I always have a sweet spot for uh, mm -hmm. Harry Potter. Right now, in my research, I'm really diving deep into Tolkien's Lord of the Rings um, because there's a pretty big debate. Uh, on the relationship between Sam and Frodo, and because uh, they could they couldn't possibly be gay because of who Tolkien was, but that, there's, there's so much stuff in the book where you're like, yeah, like that really sounds like they were gay. So it's just this really interesting uh, paradox in the text, and then looking at how Peter Jackson in his adaptation dealt with uh, their relationship and how different scholars have responded to it. Uh, because from my view, it, it's a very heteronormative adaptation, but many other people said, no, actually, like, it looks like for uh, Elijah and, I forget the actor who plays, uh, Sam, and, you know, they, they have a lot of chemistry on, on screen, so it looks like they, they might be pushing the homosexual angle. So there's a lot of disagreement, and it's just a, a really fun topic to be um, reading and writing about. That's a Unfortunately, Adam, I think we're just about out of time for your show. But uh, before we do leave, uh, if anyone wanted to ask more about I guess, your work or learn more about your story, where could they probably find you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I'm not very, I'm not at all social media. So I do have uh, one publication uh, if they want. Uh, it is uh, hashtag for the Iron Throne. It's in a a journal called This Year's Work in Medievalism. And uh, um, the the study is of um, how the marketing for Game of Thrones uh, shifts in different editions of the book um, and how the marketing for the HBO uh, series uh, moves. But I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm really not on social media. <laughs> so thanks oh, for Oh, that's, that's okay. <laughs> that's yeah, I have, no I have no that, that one publication and uh, so far, that's it. Okay. But thank you so much again for coming on to the show, Adam, to tell us about your story involving COVID. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Yeah.